Hi everyone, in this section we're going to look at improper integrals. Up till now we've been focusing on integrals over finite intervals on which the function is continuous on the entire interval including the endpoints. In this section we're going to look at extending uh, this idea in two directions. One of them is we're going to look at now cases where the interval we're integrating over is infinite either in one direction or the other direction or both directions. And we're also going to look at the case where what happens if the function's not continuous on a finite interval? We're integrating over a finite interval. Perhaps it's not continuous at the end points or maybe somewhere in the middle. So how do we deal with those two cases? That's the focus of this particular lecture. And in these cases, we call these improper integrals. So let's have a look at an example. Evaluate the area of the region bounded by the curves y equals x, 1 over x squared, so y equals 1 over x squared, y equals 0, and x equals 1. So y equals 0 is the x-axis, there's x equals 1, y equals 0, and that part of the curve. So the only region that we have that consists exclusively of those boundary curves is this region here. If you're thinking, why didn't I consider the other region, maybe the region between the y-axis and x equals 1? Well, because the y-axis would also be a boundary curve on that region. And this one's saying we only have three boundaries. Three boundaries, and that's the region there that has those three boundaries. Notice that it goes on forever, though. This is what we call an unbounded region. What do I mean by unbounded region? I mean you can't fit this region inside a circle of some finite radius. So I can't plant a circle somewhere on the plane here, pick a radius, my, even if it's big, a really big radius, as long as it's finite, I can't stick this region inside a circle of finite radius. So we call this an unbounded region. Now your first thought may be, well, if it's unbounded, its area's got to be infinite. Well, not quite. That's not necessarily implied. We can have unbounded regions that have finite areas, and we're about to see that. So what do we want to do? We want to find the area of this thing. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, the problem is that we're heading off to infinity. So instead, why don't we change the problem slightly and head off to some finite value t. And if I look at this region, let's say we want to work out the area of it, which I'll call a of t or a sub t, because it depends on what the t value is. It depends on where I cap that right hand end point. What is the area of a of t? Well, we can work that out. Now we're back into the realm of integrals over finite intervals. So what's the a of t? Well, it's the integral from 1 to t of 1 over x squared dx. The antiderivative of 1 over x squared is negative 1 over x. That goes from 1 to t, so this is negative 1 over t plus 1. So that's the area of t. And notice that as t gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, the 1 over t becomes a smaller and smaller negative. So we're starting with the value of 1 and we're taking less and less away from it the bigger t gets. Okay, so what have we done so far? Well, what we've done in terms of the pictures above is we've said, well, let's consider the area as we go from 1 to 2. Okay, what about the area from 1 to 3? What about the area from 1 to 5? What about the area from 1 to t? We'd like to know from 1 to infinity. So what we can do is we can take our expression, the area from 1 to t, and look at how it behaves in the limit as t goes to infinity. So the area of the unbounded region should be obtained, which we'll call a here, should be obtained by taking the limits of the areas of the bounded regions and looking the limit as t goes to infinity. So that's the limit as t goes to infinity of negative 1 over t plus 1. 1 over t as t goes to infinity, that goes to 0, so this goes to 1. And so what we have is that the area of that unbounded blue region, all of this stuff here, all the way out, the area is 1. 
So let's summarize what we've done so far. So integrals over these infinite intervals, either one side or both sides are going to infinity, are called improper integrals of type 1. And we're trying to just make sense of this notation here. What do we mean by the integral from a to infinity of f of x dx? How do we actually calculate that? Well, provided that the integral from a to t of f of x dx exists for all t bigger than a, and provided that the limit exists as t goes to infinity, then we define the integral from a to infinity to be that limit. We can do the same thing if we head off to negative infinity. Um, that's part b. Part b is saying how do you make sense of the integral from negative infinity to b? Well, it just means that the integrals from t to b all exist and the limit exists as t goes to negative infinity. And if that's the case, then that's what we define the integral from negative infinity to b to b. It's the value of that limit. Now, a bit of terminology. The improper integrals are called convergent if the corresponding limits exist. If the limit corresponding limit does not exist, then we say that the integral is divergent. Now, how do we make sense of an integral where both, where the lower limit of integration and the upper limit of integration are infinite? Well, in that case, we consider the two individual integrals where we go from negative infinity to some finite number and then from that finite number to infinity. So we split it up into two semi-infinite intervals and we can analyze the convergence or divergence of these two integrals by parts a and b above. We've got definitions for those. And if both of those exist, are convergent, then the general integral from negative infinity to infinity is convergent and therefore exists. If either one of these, you only need one of them to fail, if either one is divergent, then the integral from negative infinity to infinity is divergent. So the idea behind this is we're looking at an integral over uh, the entire real line in negative infinity to infinity. We don't want to consider cases where some stuff happening at the tail end of one side cancels with stuff on the tail end of the other side and the reason you get convergence is because of all of this cancellation. We don't want that to happen. We want to consider the case where both of the individual semi-infinite integrals, so what's going on way off to one side and way off to the other side, we don't care about how they relate to one another. We just want to know, do each one of those things exist? And if they do, then the sum of them will be the integral over the entire real line. Okay, so we analyze those independ independently. That's a key feature here with going from negative infinity to infinity. We analyze the endpoints individually. Let's look at some examples. So in part A, we're looking at the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x dx. 1 to infinity of 1 over x dx. So we're looking at this region here. And it goes on forever. And the question is, does that converge or diverge? In other words, is this area finite or infinite? So what we do is we take the integral from 1 to infinity, 1 over x dx. What does this notation mean? It means you're looking at the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to t of 1 over x dx. Now that's equal to the limit as t goes to infinity of ln of absolute value of x from 1 to t, which is the limit as t goes to infinity of ln of t minus ln of 1, which is 0. Now what's the limit as t goes to infinity of ln of t? Well, as t gets big, ln of t gets big, so this is going to be infinite. So what that means is that the area of this region is infinite. And so we'll say that the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x dx is divergent or diverges. So in this case, this integral diverges. 
Now what about part b? The integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x squared dx. So again, the picture, very similar to the one above, something like this. It just hugs closer and closer. As x gets bigger, 1 over x squared would have been smaller than the corresponding 1 over x value. So we're going from 1 up, off to infinity. So dot, 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 goes on forever. What is the value of this integral? In other words, what is the area of this region? So this is 1 over x squared from 1 to infinity. This is exactly the one we just did on the, uh, as a motivating example, but we'll just work it out again to see how to actually write this. So we're looking at the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to t of 1 over x squared dx. So that is the limit as t goes to infinity of negative 1 over x from 1 to t, which is the limit as t goes to infinity of negative 1 over t plus 1. Now as t goes to infinity, that first term goes to 0, and so we get a value of 1 coming out. So what does this mean? It means that the integral converges. And what does it converge to? It converges to 1. Geometrically, what this means is that the area is finite and is equal to 1. So the area of that region, this unbounded region, the area of it is finite. It's got a value of 1. So let's have a look at the next example. The integral from negative infinity to 0 of 1 over square root of 1 minus x dx. Uh, one thing to notice here, though, that the integrand, it's discontinuous. Where is it discontinuous? It's discontinuous when the denominator is 0, and that's happening when x is 1. But x equals 1 is not in our interval of integration. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're looking at these integrals. Just make sure the function is continuous on the interval you're looking at. If not, well, that's the example that we're going to study next, the next topic in improper integrals of type 2. That's how to deal with things where you've got a discontinuity in the interval that you're integrating over. So it's in good habit right now to start checking discontinuity functions on the intervals that you're integrating over. So in this case, this is equal to the limit as t goes to negative infinity of the integral from t to 0 of 1 over the square root of 1 minus x dx. So the limit as t goes to negative infinity, the antiderivative of this is going to be the square root of 1 minus x, and then we have to adjust by a factor of a negative 2 out front, because when I do take the derivative of that square root, a 1 half comes down, and then a negative comes out from the chain rule and I want those to cancel with the negative 2 out front to leave me with just a 1 up top. So there is our antiderivative. And this evaluates to the limit as t goes to negative infinity of negative 2 plus 2 times the square root of 1 minus t. Now as t goes to negative infinity, we have 1 minus t. That's getting bigger in the positive square root of that. So this thing is heading off to infinity as well. So that means that this integral diverges or is divergent. So that's a divergent integral. The integral diverges. How about the next one? The integral from negative infinity to infinity of 1 over 1 plus x squared dx. How about that one? Well, here we've got both upper and lower limits of integration being infinite, so we're going to have to split it up. So you need to go from negative infinity to 0, 1 over 1 plus x squared dx. It doesn't matter where you split it up, just as long as you split it up somewhere. Um, here I pick 0. Um, it seems to be an obvious choice, um, but you could have split it at 1 or 2 or pi, or wherever you want, just as long as you split the integral up into two integrals. Now we go to work on each one of these. In order for the general integral to converge, I need the individual 
integrals to converge. So I'm going to look at those individual ones. This is the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from, actually we're going to negative infinity, from t to 0 of 1 over 1 plus x squared dx plus the limit as, and I've already used t as my dummy variable for my limit in the previous one, so I'm going to change that to an s now. So s goes to infinity from 0 to s of 1 over 1 plus x squared dx. So this becomes an arctan. Oh, we still have the limit. I haven't evaluated that yet. So the limit as t goes to negative infinity. Arctan is the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus x squared of x from t to 0 plus the limit as s goes to infinity of arc tan of x from 0 to s. Now arc tan of 0 is 0, so this becomes the limit as t goes to negative infinity of negative arc tan of t plus the limit as s goes to infinity of arc tan of s. So what are the values of these limits? Well, it is helpful to remember what the graph of arctan looks like. So what does the graph of arctan of x look like? Well, it's got some horizontal asymptotes, pi by 2 and negative pi by 2. And it looks like this. So it's a good idea to know this graph. Always comes up when you're dealing with arctan. Um, and trying to figure out values associated to it. So this is always a good thing to have in mind. So the arctan function as t goes to negative infinity, arctan goes to negative pi by 2, but there's an extra negative there. So we've got a negative, negative pi by 2. And then the limit of s goes to infinity of arctan s is pi by 2. So pi by 2 plus pi by 2 is pi. So what does this actually tell us? It tells us that the integral in question converges, for one thing, converges to pi, but if we look at the graph of the original function, that's y equals 1 over 1 plus x squared, what we just found is that the area of this unbounded region is pi. The area is pi. That's what we found. So the maybe I should jot down here that our conclusion is that the integral converges to pi. And geometrically, that means the area under the curve is pi. Kind of interesting that a rational function, 1 over 1 plus x squared, something that doesn't seem to be, you know, at first glance, to be related to trigonometric functions in any way, shape, or form. So why should it even be related to pi? Why should it even be related to a circle? Because pi is related to uh, properties of the circle, uh, relationship between radius and circumference, or diameter and circumference. So why should pi even come up in a function, uh, related to a function, that doesn't seem to be related to a circle? That's a rather interesting question. And we can see here that even though 1 over 1 plus x squared doesn't seem to be related to a circle, it in some sense is because of the relationship through calculus with the arctan function, the inverse tangent function.